All right, so we have just wrapped up talking about the respiratory system in pathophysiology. And one of the more important respiratory disorders that we learned about is pneumonia. And there is so much to learn about pneumonia. And my students were like, hey, could you make a video over kind of the high points of pneumonia? Well, it's kind of hard to hit all the high points in a short video, but I'm going to try. So we're going to start out with the risk factors, the etiology, the pathophysiology, the manifestations, and the assessments. So with our risk factors, you got to think about um, altered immunity or altered defense mechanisms. So we have things in place like a cough reflex. We have cilia um, in our airway that help move things up to be coughed out. We have macrophages, right, that migrate to pathogens and engulf them in, in a phagocytose. So if one or multiple of these immune defenses are compromised, then we're going to be more at risk for developing pneumonia, even after just a simple respiratory infection. So starting off with risk factors, obviously the elderly and then the very young. Intubation, so being intubated and on mechanical ventilation places a patient at high risk for pneumonia. They can't protect their own airway, for one. Um, they depend on the nurse or respiratory therapy to suction them. Um, they require oral care um, to you know, keep their mouth clean and uh, protect them from pathogens. So intubation places patients at higher risk. A decreased level of consciousness, think of stroke patients or patients that have overdosed on narcotics or sedatives, um, alcohol, you know, alcohol dependent patients um, that come in with lowered level of consciousness. Um, or think about it this way, somebody who is alcohol dependent, they have a higher risk for aspirating um, contents causing an aspiration pneumonia. Also, just any chronic disease, but in particular like COPD, uh, because they're on steroids, right? And steroids um, decrease immunity. And our smokers are always kind of at high risk for developing pneumonia. So with the etiology, you can break it down lots of different ways. I've got it broken down here into community acquired, hospital acquired, and then opportunistic. So community acquired pneumonia is going to be kind of our least serious type of pneumonia or least critical. Um, and this is where we're thinking of pathogens like bacteria or a virus. Um, hospital acquired, so we're thinking about ventilator associated pneumonia like we talked about, um, intubation with mechanical ventilation. There's also different pathogens that patients can pick up, you know, a nosocomial infection. And if a patient picks up a pathogen in the hospital, typically these are going to tend to be more um, antibiotic resistant pathogens. And so hospital acquired pneumonia is typically going to be much more serious than community acquired. And then we have that opportunistic type of pneumonia, which is typically going to be a fungus. Um, so I'm thinking of PJP pneumonia that um, affects our HIV um, and AIDS patients, those fungi, fungus are like very opportunistic, okay? So when you think about opportunistic pathogens, they are most of the time going to be um, fungal infections, all right? So then moving on to our patho, we're going to talk about pneumonia that is caused by streptococcus pneumonia, okay? That's bacteria, and it's the most common bacteria that causes pneumonia. So most of the time when you're learning about pneumonia, um, it's people are referring to the pneumonia caused by strep pneumonia or streptococcus pneumonia. This is pneumococcal pneumonia. So that pathogen, you know, obviously there has to be exposure to it. That pathogen then triggers the inflammatory response. So the inflammatory response sets into motion lots of things, including uh, massive vasodilation. And then the inflammatory response and all the chemical mediators that um, go into the inflammatory response kind of damage the capillaries, leading to this capillary leak. 
Um, and then the mi the white blood cells are going to migrate um, to that area where the pathogen has landed within the lungs. And this leads to formation of edema and what we call exudate. An exudate just kind of consists of fluid, white blood cells, some proteins. We just, when we think about, think about exudate, it always goes along with some kind of infective process or in infection. And then obviously because of the fluid buildup within the alveoli, gas exchange is then impaired. So the alveoli are the final terminal, those tiny little air sacs at the very end of our airway. And that is where gas exchange takes place. This is where oxygen leaves the alveoli and enters the blood and where CO2 leaves the blood and enters the alveoli to be exhaled. Well, when all this fluid builds up within the alveoli, gas exchange is then impaired. So what are our manifestations? Obviously, fever and chills are going to go along with any infectious process, right? But we're going to think about what is unique. Um, and so a cough with rust-colored sputum is kind of unique to streptococcal pneumonia or pneumococcal pneumonia. And it happens because of the damage to the capillaries, some of those red blood cells are leaking out as well. And so that sputum that the patient coughs up may have a rust color to it. Crackles may be heard kind of initially um, down, you know, low in the airways or whatever when the infection is kind of new. Then it's going to progress to what we call bronchial breath sounds. Now, bronchial breath sounds are typically only heard up at the top of the airway. They're very loud and very hollow, um, but they're not supposed to be heard throughout the lung fields. What you're supposed to hear in a healthy patient are bronchovesicular breast sounds. But with pneumococcal pneumonia, these white blood cells and the exudate and all this gunk that is triggered because of the inflammatory process consolidates itself within a lobe of the lung and now the breath sounds are bouncing off that consolidation and you're not going to hear a normal breath sound what you're going to hear is that breath sound being bounced off an area of consolidation and so you're going to hear bronchial breath sounds and obviously we're going to see consolidation on the chest x-ray so consolidation or patchy infiltrates it it just equals fluid, okay? On chest x-ray, white equals fluid, black equals air. Okay, so what are we going to assess? Now, a lot of this is going to be kind of going on kind of simultaneously, right? Obviously, respiratory rate, effort, are they using accessory muscles to breathe? The quality of respirations. We're going to listen to those breath sounds. We're going to look at O2 saturation. How is their gas exchange in that way? How is their oxygenation? Um, heart rate and blood pressure, right? Always ABC, airway, breathing, circulation. Level of consciousness. Why is this important? Well, these patients are at risk for a respiratory acidosis, right? Because all the fluid is possibly preventing a good full inhalation and exhalation. So level of consciousness is going to tell us a lot about their oxygenation as well as their ventilation. Skin color and temperature, we're going to look at the cough. We're going to ask them about a cough, you know, assess the appearance of any sputum that we see. And then the diagnostics that we're going to look at, obviously ABGs, because like I said, we're going to be monitoring for the development of respiratory acidosis. Hopefully we're able to avoid that. We're going to look at the chest x-ray, which is typically diagnostic. And we're also going to get sputum cultures so we can identify the organism and treat it with the right antibiotic or other anti-infective that the patient may need. So I hope this has been helpful. Happy studying and go Vols!